I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, the good and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to the Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Dean Detloff, coming to you currently before the turn of the new year in Toronto. And I'm Matt Pernico. I'm coming to you after the turn of the new year. Just kidding. <laughs> Not really. How's it look over there, Matt? <laughs> Bleak. Bad. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. This is only December 30th. We haven't reached 2021 yet. So I don't know, Dean, do you have any good New Year's resolutions? You know, uh, my partner Emily was just asking me about that, and I did not have a good answer for her. So, no, I feel like last year I had this great resolution. I was really proud of it. It was, as people know on this podcast, to teach myself about poetry, to learn about it, read about it, have some favorite poets by the end of the year, and maybe even write some myself. And I did feel like I was on a roll in the beginning of the year, but then all this stuff happened, and I got to tell you, I wish I would have stuck to it because I could use a lot of poetry right now. So now I'm I'm very reticent to create a new resolution for 2021. It's going to come to me in a lightning flash at midnight. That's how I feel. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think I adopted that uh, new resolution alongside you last year, and I now am the proud owner of two books of poetry. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I do have more than I did before. Yeah, I've I've read them a bit, but not not to completion. So. Uh... <laughs> I didn't quite do it so much <laughs> so much other stuff going on not that's in the true. mood to read poetry right now yeah that's all right um yeah i don't know it's a weird year we didn't really know what we were gonna do for this final episode of 2020 it also i feel like christmas and new year's were very strange for the podcasting schedule um having holidays come on fridays just kind of throws everything off but uh here we are we did decide finally on something to do And we're not just going to talk about this bad year. We're not just going to do a roundup of all the episodes that we've done this past year or talk through any other bad idea that we might have had. Instead, uh, we are going to talk about what is going to happen potentially or could happen or should happen after all this pandemic stuff is over. I think that we all need a bit of a horizon, whether or not it ever materializes. We need to be able to think about the future in some way. That's meaningful. And uh, that's what we're going to do here for a while. How does that sound, Matt? Thinking about what comes after this bizarre moment in time. Yeah, I think it sounds really good. I remember in the very early days of the pandemic back in April and March, I guess. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I kept thinking to myself, like, this is also awful. And I was reading the headlines every day about how many people are getting sick. And it was it was terrible. And the thing that kind of kept me going was like, how will we ever hold people accountable for this and uh, (laughs) I hope that we do I guess is kind of maybe that's my New Year's resolution this year my New Year's resolution is to (laughs) hold people accountable to the bad things they did during COVID-19 pandemic Um, I I think though there are other organizations that are starting to think about this out out there Um, other you know NGOs other political organizations um, starting to think about like what does it mean uh, to have some kind of systemic and society-wide recovery, right? Uh, the the big vaccines on the horizon for a lot of people, um, it's slow going. It's a slog. People in the United States have gotten it at such a slow pace. Who knows when we'll ever actually get it? But just the idea that there is a vaccine mm-hmm. on the horizon and that mm-hmm. there is some kind of like end to this has gotten people uh, thinking, 
you know, what does it mean to recover? What do we do next? Like, what kinds of opportunities and disadvantages does, has this COVID-19 like kind of give us? So we thought it would be a good idea to do, yeah, this episode that maybe explored some of those ideas and to think about justice and liberation in um, the context of, uh, you know, the next year or so. Um, kind of coming out of this weird COVID time. So uh, here it is, our official Christianity and socialism take on, uh, I don't know, how to use this time where the pandemic is not quite over, but maybe almost uh, to our advantage. Yeah, I mean, it's so hard to have this conversation in general, and I'm sure a lot of people feel this way. I do anyway, because nobody really knows what's going to happen. I mean, we we're all sort of hoping that the pandemic will be over, but governments say that i don't know we might be in the same boat a year from now or something my impression i guess is nobody really has any idea what's going on uh planning for the worst i guess which is probably the best um thing to do but nevertheless it is important to consider whether it's done uh whether the pandemic is basically over in in you know whatever six months or 12 months or longer uh we have to be thinking about how to demand something different and like you said matt hold people accountable um, I think that for me, it's it's also hard to have this conversation because it does feel so debilitating, like pandemic life mm -hmm. feels demotivating, you know, not being uh, able to sort of freely gather with um, all the people I used to gather with or be able to show up downtown at a big rally with a big flag or something like that. Right. You can't really do that um, in the same way anymore. And so it can sort of feel like, well, what is there to even do or, or hope for? But Thankfully, uh, there are a lot of people trying to imagine that and not only Christians and not only socialists, but both. So true to Magnificast uh, style, we'll try to maybe figure out what the Venn diagram connections are between what both of those groups are proposing. And Matt, maybe we can also think through how to uh, make those boundaries a little more porous or try to figure out um, where those folks can talk to each other a little bit more. Uh, I don't know. Off the bat, Matt, before we get into any specific things here, um, what's your uh, your major what's what's on your mind when you think about a recovery from the pandemic? I guess what's your kind of major um, touch point or, or theme or where does your mind seem to be going when you think that through? Yeah, well, I think just because of maybe the the circles that I travel in these days, uh, the thing I think of first is always about essential workers. <laughs> Uh, you know, in the in the early days of the pandemic, even until now, um, we've created this whole new category of worker, which is kind of bizarre and probably in some ways works against the labor movement. But we can talk about, about that more, maybe. Um, you know, we've created this term essential workers where all of these groups of people, all of these um, types of occupations <laughs> fall into. And, uh, you know, the, the term essential here is kind of relative to what? Uh, whether or not your boss wants you to come to work, I guess. But um, I think it's a really interesting thing that's happened where all of a sudden um, a society that has basically thought of, uh, you know, people on the front lines uh, or people who are essential workers as completely disposable. Uh, you know, we've seen people at least shift in their mind the way they think about them. I mean, there's like tons of really cheesy stuff too, like, you know, in, in New York or in other big cities where people would go out and clap on their, porches or whatever for uh you know emts and other medical workers and i, I don't know that's fine i have nothing wrong with that give those people a clap for sure <laughs> um but i guess like it's just really interesting to me that, that has something that's really risen to the top is like uh you know even people have like in my neighborhood at least they have like yard signs that are like thank you essential mm -hmm. workers <laughs> and i don't know if anyone's reading them but uh anyways all that to say that there's like this new sort of um there's this new glorified and rightfully so category of worker in the popular imagination of people, uh, at least in the United States. I'm sure Canada's probably the same way too, Dean, but you can tell me, mm -hmm. I guess. Anyways, I think it's all really interesting. It would be really great to uh, see a lot of emphasis given to those essential workers that people care so much about now. Uh, that's done. I mean, you know, wh whether, or, I mean, it won't naturally happen, right? It's going to have to be definitely a, a process of political pressure. But um, if we all really care about essential workers as much as we say we do, um, maybe it's a really good time to change some labor laws. It'd be a good time to pass the the Protecting the Right to Organize Act in the, in the United States to make it easier for people to join a union. It's a great time to um, start talking about raising the minimum wage, uh, you know, to something way higher. 
uh, you know, all of these things. Uh, I think the the um, as we recover, uh, hopefully <laughs> from a pandemic in the coming year, um, it gives us like a really great opportunity to think about uh, the way we think about workers in our society and the way that we empower them. So maybe that's a, a place that we can kind of start thinking about a just recovery. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, and it's true. We do have the same <laughs> sort of bizarre uh, essential worker valorization in, in Canada, which is a, a difficult thing to think through, good in some ways, bad in others. Um, yeah, but it's good to get that on the table. We'll talk more about that, too. I think, for me, the thing that is sticking out the most is attention to internationalism. Um, it's both my kind of greatest hope and greatest fear that maybe the COVID pandemic will, I don't know, put some kind of sense of global solidarity in certain people's minds where it wasn't before. You know, I think about like one thing that has been so fascinating about the pandemic is that uh, you really get a sense of the diversity of political experiences in the world that maybe you wouldn't otherwise. Right. Like, uh, as we always mm. say in this podcast, say what you will about China. But uh, in the case of covid, I mean, they did certainly deal with the pandemic in a pretty impressive way, so much so that. You know, the UN and the WHO and everybody else is saying there's lots of lessons to be learned there. Um, but it's not just China, even uh, other countries, um, you know, Vietnam, Cuba, other socialist countries have managed to keep their um, response incredibly impressive despite having, you know, no resources at all. Uh, but even beyond socialist countries, I think like people in the United States probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about like Japan and South Korea and even Australia or New Zealand or other countries in general, I guess, um, because the U S is such a chauvinist country. And I think, mm. I guess my, my hope is that people may have recovered some sense of belonging to a bigger world community and also some sense to that, you know, the United States is not actually doing the best job uh, at every single thing. I think, probably people that listen to this podcast, I would hope are not <laughs> American exceptionalists, but, uh, you know, I've already noticed just talking with like family members and friends in general, who I probably wouldn't expect to, to have that kind of global awareness. People are already, you know, just talking about how, you know, in other countries, people can do this and that. And why can't we do that here? And those are really encouraging critical questions. So I'm, I'm hopeful about that. And also just concerned because, you know, <laughs> that can lead to good and bad things. But nevertheless, important to recover that sense of internationalism. Yeah, I think it's a really great point. I mean, it's uh, I appreciate that you laid it out <laughs> that as a, a sword that cuts both ways. On the one hand, you recognize that you're part of a larger world community, uh, which I guess is kind of ironic given the extremely isolating nature of this yeah, right. uh, whole pandemic situation. <laughs> but also uh, it does lay bare any uh, claim to American exceptionalism. Um, you know, you can look at the numbers and uh, and and see the uh, the fruits that the healthcare system in this country bear. Uh, it's not good, mm. and uh, I don't know how you'd think that after this. But I mean, people will continue, I guess. But <laughs> still, it'll be a lot easier to have conversations, right? Like um, uh, in the United States. Well, okay, people in Canada. You're talking about recovery. You're talking about justice. You're talking about uh, how to hold people accountable. People in the United States are just like worried to death that nobody's going to have any money and get evicted from their right. house uh, because that's sort of the the uh, political landscape of of this country. But um, I guess it, it strikes me as being funny because in that discourse, people, um, you know, right wing politicians are coming out and saying, like, you know, uh, if uh, a big stimulus check or whatever, a covid relief check of two thousand dollars or whatever, that's socialism. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, probably not. <laughs> it's not actually socialism, <laughs> but um but for sure, people uh, getting evicted from their homes, people dying because they don't have, uh, you know, health insurance. That's capitalism. Absolutely. Um, it lays bare the entire situation that we're in and uh, I think really explicates um, all of the features that usually get swept under the, under the rug. You can't uh, you can't hide the fact you, you can't hi hide the, the, the brutalization that capitalism kind of puts people through um, on a daily basis. It's just like more obvious right now because everyone's paying attention in different ways than they were before the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Or at least uh, if you can hide it, which a lot of people seem to be doing, um, you have to go to sort of great, great lengths to um, continually pull the wool over your own eyes or something. Um, yeah, there's a there's a phrase in the uh, the labor movement that I've seen a lot of people employ lately where uh, um, they'll they'll make they'll draw the point out in sort of the rhetoric of their, you know, their digital campaigns or like a, an email or whatever I'm reading 
from them <laughs> where people they'll say, you know, we can't go back to normal because like in normal, uh, even when things were normal before the pandemic, people were still making seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour and like didn't have health care. Right. And and now it's like so much worse because uh, your hours have been cut and all these other kinds of things, too. Um, you don't have sick time, etc. I don't know. It just kind of like lays it all out. It, uh, it makes it very clear uh, exactly how thing how bad things are right now. But also uh, it shows you that things were also bad before the pandemic. Yeah. I, um, I don't know. Uh, it's kind of hard to parse out exactly um, how I'm feeling about the pandemic since we're still in the middle of it. But I do have a lot of Paul Virilio feels <laughs> about it right now. Uh, you know, like sort of learning from the university of disaster, you're seeing things kind of fall apart. And uh, I think it drastically changes the way that you think about uh, your own your own country, your own social context, your own political imagination. Even if you were someone who was not... Uh, you know, crazy about America in the first place. It changes a lot of things for you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's this kind of revelationary moment in that way. Um, I think that uh, that rhetoric around not going back to normal is actually really powerful and one that seems to be catching on in a lot of places. Uh, you mentioned the labor movement. It's also been a feature of Pope Francis's comments about the pandemic uh, all over the place. He's he's done lots of addresses. It was in Fratelli Tutti. It's also been in plenty of uh, kind of just popular... I don't know, speeches, things like that. And he, too, kind of brings that out regularly that we, we don't want to go back to normal because normal was not good. Uh, we have to be able to think differently, use this moment as an opportunity or a sort of clearing in which to think about how to how to do something that's, you know, not like it was, not as bad as it was. Um, I think that is a good rhetorical move. Uh, whether or not it catches on, of course, has... Uh, well, I guess we'll find out. It has to sort of be tested after this. I'm not very confident, but nevertheless, um, it is good to sort of key on in on what rhetoric sort of works. And to get into that side of it, maybe we can dive into some of these campaigns, Matt, and then we can kind of parse out what's really going on and what's interesting about them um, later on. So one group that I think, at least in Canada, is doing a good job of having that conversation about not going back to normal and trying to do something different is actually development and peace, which is the Catholic church in Canada's um, social justice organization. So it was established by the Catholic bishops um, many decades ago now, like 60 years ago or something. Uh, but it is, um, it's kind of, well, we've had Jim Hodgson on this podcast several times before. So if you listen to him talk about his work at the United church, this is kind of the Catholic version of that. So they have uh, partners all around the world in different countries that they have relationships with. And that's kind of where they gather their um, information and from where they build their campaigns, that sort of thing. So in terms of uh, the pandemic, they put together a campaign called the Recovering Together campaign, which is pretty impressive, actually, uh, especially for something that had to be put together quite quickly. I'm sure they had lots of other plans um, this year but they uh, managed to put together a good campaign that gets a lot of things out on the table. And I'll just mention a few things that I think are really relevant here for, for Christians especially, but socialists too. Um, one is that they, they talk no, not only about that need to recover differently, but they point to a number of concrete things to do. Um, we can talk more about other groups they work with to sort of come up with different principles. But again, going back to that internationalism I was talking about earlier, they really root their campaign in their relationships to people in other countries. So for them, the pandemic, you know, we don't want to go back to normal in our own countries because that was bad. But we also don't want to go back to normal in terms of our global relations because the people that they work with on a daily basis outside the pandemic are suffering all the time from the effects of global capitalism and uh, all kinds of other injustices. Um, so I don't know. I mean, Matt, you've had a chance to look at the campaign a little bit. I've been looking at it uh, longer just by virtue of, you know, following it uh, over the, the past several months. But um, I mean, what do you think about this kind of thing? Like, uh, here's a, a sort of Catholic Christian organization trying to figure out how to find a language and some demands to put together for a, a just recovery. Uh, how can Christians maybe intervene in that conversation? I think it's such an interesting thing. Well, let me note here really quick, too, that um, this campaign, like you said, Dean, is is like from this like sort of Canadian organization of the Catholic Church. Um, I maybe I'm not plugged into the right places, but I have not seen so much of this type of language from um, from organizations in the United States. 
I did a quick, I just did a, some quick research, just kind of like looking around to see if anyone else was. And it seems like this, this kind of language about a just recovery does show up or, or people's recovery. That's another word that some people have used a, a few places around the United States. Like it seems like some DSA folks are kind of involved in, in some things like this, um, as well as uh, a few branches of like labor unions. But I'm not seeing it as much. <laughs> the The branding isn't as strong in the United States, for sure, <laughs> if, if it's here. So I think it's really interesting, too, that there's like that kind of division. I mean, I think right now everyone in the United States is like so focused on fighting tooth and nail just not to get evicted from their house that I think even thinking about recovery is probably a step too for, for a step too far for them. But all that being said, <laughs> um, I think that this is a really interesting thing for a, like a Christian organization. I mean, a Catholic organization like Development and Peace to do. I think it's it's such an unusual thing, or maybe a, this is another example of like my complete U.S. centric worldview or something. But it's such an interesting thing to have a Christian organization like directly asking the government to do X, Y, and Z things that would make people's life a whole lot better. I mean, I know it happens in some ways, but I guess never so systemically like this. Um, to act like you know part part of the part of the campaign, like I mean, like you mentioned too, is is like the internationalism part, which is good. But even just asking the government to like take care of people, and as like coming from this like sort of religious angle, is such an interesting thing. Um, again, maybe just sort of outside the um, the uh, political imaginary of some of the United States, but I think that is just fascinating within itself. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a good thing for Christian. I mean, if uh, Catholics, if Christians in general, if we're supposed to be some kind of moral uh, moral guidance to uh, the world, I think that it only makes sense that we would ask uh, ask for these, you know, types of uh, uh, justice kind of coming out of like, you know, what might be the most unjust situation yeah. <laughs> in such a long time. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up that difference between the U.S. and Canada. Um you know, well, for people who don't know who listen to this podcast, I'm a U.S. citizen, but I've lived here in Canada for a lot of years now. I don't know, seven or eight, seven, I think seven. Anyway, uh, I've been here a while. And I mean, whenever people find out that you're from the United States and Canada, they have a lot of things they want to talk to you about. Uh, one of them is trying to psychoanalyze the differences between these countries. So you get a lot of good pop psychology <laughs> and folk explanations for why why these two countries are so different. And some of them are more or less compelling to me. Um, one that I think does kind of make sense here, though, is I hear a lot of people talk about how Canadians believe in their institutions more than people in the United States. Um, there's also ways of explaining that. Some people think it has to do with the origins of the societies, right? Uh, the United States is born in this kind of uh, revolutionary moment, a property revolution, of course, so within limitations. But nevertheless, it's, it's sort of defined by its um, se secession from... Uh, it's independence from the UK, whereas Canada, I mean, you know, we still have to ask the uh, the monarchy for permission to form a government whenever we have an election. So there's this kind of uh, deep rooted, um, I don't know, faith or trust in public institutions in Canada that is different. I, I'm not I don't know whether or not that's true. I can't say. I will say, though, what's bizarre to me about the two countries is you were mentioning that people are you know fighting tooth and nail to uh, keep their homes and not be evicted. The same thing happens here in Canada. Um, you wouldn't know it. I mean, we do have 100%. We have more supports than people in the United States. So I don't mean to pretend that these are exactly the same situations. They're not, for sure. But uh, it's also like Canada is good compared to the very worst. <laughs> you know, it's one of those situations. <laughs> so like here in Toronto, uh, I know a lot of people who work in tenants organizing efforts and working with homeless folks, etc. And uh, they are not, um, you know, they don't have a lot of faith in just recovery in Canada either, but it's nevertheless very interesting that there are lots of civil society organizations and uh, other kinds of groups that are willing to kind of make these appeals to uh, public agencies and governments in a way that, I mean, they must feel like they could have some kind of influence. Otherwise, why waste the time? Um, so and that is true, right? Advocating a just recovery, it does seem sort of more possible in Canada, even if it's not ultimately possible, <laughs> rather than in the US, there's just kind of a different feeling of efficacy for some reason. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's really occurred to anyone here yet to like actually ask the government to do anything that is uh, <laughs> beyond giving us checks. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's not true. But it feels that way. at least. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. 
<laughs> yeah, I will say, man, one thing. OK, this is a complete aside, but it's very important that I do this on the podcast that I say this on record. One thing that drives me absolutely bonkers <laughs> is uh, there's a lot of propaganda around Canada's. Um, it's called the CERB, the CERB, the Canada Emergency Relief Benefit. Um, which if you read about it on Twitter, people will tell you that uh, Canada is giving like a UBI program of $2,000 a month to everybody who's unemployed. That is not true. Mm. <laughs> it is uh, wildly limited, tied to your taxes. Um, it is means tested and it will be taxed uh, again later in the spring and potentially clawed back. And also um, it's not the case that if you're just unemployed, you qualify. It's a, uh, a whole kind of list of things you have to make a case that you uh lost your your job an opportunity because of covid it's it's bizarre it's like a huge mess uh that being said like i said it is way better than what's going on in the u.s which is nothing um and you know my uh <laughs> i've directly benefited from it so i'm not upset about it for sure <laughs> i'm happy that i get it uh no doubt about that but um don't don't believe the hype, I guess, is what I'm saying. We need more. We need not less, but more. And we shouldn't be satisfied with uh, table scraps. That's what I'm trying to say. Whether you're in Canada or the U.S., you should demand more all the time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about some of like what the what those things are that people are really demanding. Um, so Development and Peace, they've signed on to a campaign uh, with a handful of principles uh, about uh, what a just recovery looks like. I think they're kind of interesting. Um, insofar as I think that they are, I mean, whether you live in Canada or the United States, I think that they are actually things that probably would translate to both places broadly. But I think what's really interesting about them is that they really open up the space to have some deeper political conversations with people mm -hmm. than you probably would have normally. And that's kind of fascinating. Um, so, right. Development Peace, I signed on to these principles from an, another campaign called Just Recovery. Uh, Dean, do you want to run us through the, the principles here really quick? Tell us all the sure. good ones. There are six principles. They go like this. Put people's health and well-being first, and no exceptions. That's the first one. Two, strengthen the social safety net and provide relief directly to people. Three, prioritize the needs of workers and communities. Four, build resilience to prevent future crises. Five, build solidarity and equity across communities, generations, and borders. And six, uphold indigenous rights um, and uh, work. Sorry, this <laughs> the font on this one is very small. Uphold indigenous rights and work in partnership with indigenous peoples. Um, they outline what that mean, what all these principles mean in greater detail in the campaign. But those are the six in brief. Yeah, not such bad things, actually. I think they all sound pretty OK. I mean, um, I think that they are probably ultimately too vague, even with the extra explanations. But um, but fine. I mean, if you're coming up with a broad list of things that people can just generally agree to, I think these are all like things that people would have a hard time saying no to. Um, I think they're really fascinating, though, because they are interesting starting off points for people. Like if you were like um, trying to get your mom or whoever to sign on to this same petition or these same principles, it would be a really interesting thing to be like, OK, um, we might have put we have, might have different politics, very different politics. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we can both agree that like this this pandemic has been awful. Um, and uh, going forward, the government should put people's health and well-being first without any exceptions. And it would be a very interesting conversation to have with somebody. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, I think what's so fascinating about coming it, like of this portion, I think, of the COVID-19 pandemic is that like, um, yeah, I, I mean, so, so much of the bullshit just kind of gets like pushed away. Right. Like, I, I mean, political ideology is certainly still a thing. I'm not going to say that's gone or whatever, but the material conditions definitely pull out, I think, a lot of um, the, it cuts a lot of the bullshit that kind of gets gets in the way. Right. Like um, people who say that they're for small government and small government only. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's hard to say that it's hard to say that this side of the covid pandemic, that that's what you're for when um, uh, people don't have money to pay the rent. They don't have money to go to the hospital. Like, it's hard to say that you're for like no, like small government when you can see people suffering and that like you can see the exact uh results of like what those types of policies get you um i, I guess I'm, I'm what i'm trying to say again is it's it's explicating the sort of situation mm -hmm. that we're in um and i think that's really interesting and, and these these principles um i think help draw those out in, in conversation with people yeah that's right i mean it is uh <laughs> the explication that the pandemic has afforded has definitely given the why to a lot of economic ideas whether or not people realize it right like 
if you talk to any libertarian for two minutes, they'll be like, if the government just got out of the way and everyone just did what was in their own best interest, it would all be fine. But that is literally what's happening in the pandemic, right? The government did get out of the way. It's, <laughs> it's true. It's not telling anyone what to do and uh, not giving them any help. And people are making stupid, bad decisions all the time. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. It, it's it's perversely helpful in that respect, although it's unfortunate. It's not it shouldn't be. Uh, you shouldn't need a pandemic to convince you that being a libertarian is is not smart. But maybe you do. I don't know. Uh, what I think is great about this campaign, though, is you're right, Matt, some of them are vague, but some of them are quite specific. Like, so the the principles in themselves are broad, but in the details, for example, in the, the workers one, which, of course, is interesting for socialists, they say uh, support must be distributed in a manner consistent with indigenous sovereignty, a climate resilient economy and worker rights, including safe and fair labor standards and a right to unionize. Improved conditions for essential service workers must be maintained beyond the crisis. And they go on to say that like bailouts should be to working people, not to uh, CEOs or whatever. Um, And I think that, Mm -hmm. you know, like those are still kind of broad, but they clearly point in a certain direction and they they get your mind thinking about, you know, yeah, like working people are the backbone of of a society and you got to keep that thing strong if you don't want it to get thrown into crisis. Um, The fact that something, you know, so this is a this is a campaign that a lot of people have signed on to. Development and peace is one of them, but there's also a ton of like, if you look at the the endorsers, there's a ton of other religious groups. So there's other churches, um, some individual congregations even around here. Uh, some you would expect like Kairos, which is the uh, social justice organization of the United Church in Canada. Um, again, shout out to Jim Hodgson and all his good work. Uh, but uh, uh, not, I'm not saying he's uh, responsible for that, by the way, just saying. A very cool guy. Um, anyway, lots of other <laughs> lots of other Christians involved here, but including uh, like the the Society of the Sacred Heart is on here. Um, the Sisters of Saint Joseph, like lots of nuns and religious orders, things like that. The fact that all these different groups are signing on to something that is, uh, you know, directly calling for like a greater uh, attention to the right to unionize and things like that. I think that it's actually very significant and. Whether or not it achieves some kind of groundswell or whatever, it's getting certain community organizations to think critically about their own relationship to these six principles. And I think, you know, that's what campaigns are for, right? Building uh, education, building awareness, um, both for signatories and for uh, the public that they're trying to engage. So I think I'm encouraged by that, that uh, there are some Christians who are reckoning with this and there are also... uh, you know, other civil society organizations that are ending up in proximity to to all kinds of other orgs uh, coalescing around these kinds of points. Of all the things that, you know, are are explicated by the pandemic, I guess that's that's what I'm just going to keep saying. Mm-hmm. I mean, just la- the pandemic lays bare so much, right? It teaches you so many things if you pay attention to it. I don't know. It seems like such a hard thing to even come away from this situation and thinking unions are bad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like (laughs) every other day, there is like a terrible story about a boss, you know, treating his employees awful and putting them directly in harm's way. Right. Like er earlier this summer uh, at a at a McDonald's in California, there was uh, there was a, a, a franchise owner, a McDonald's franchise owner that was like telling his employees to uh like you know they didn't have masks for them sorry too bad you can wear dog diapers mm-hmm, on your face mm-hmm. instead and i'll buy you some of those or like um i mean the look at the the fact like the tyson factory workers who are like packing meat like those people have gotten covid like at these extreme rates um or even like i think there's a story that came out on abc the other day that was about like uh um a manager at, at like a tyson meat packing plant that had like a betting pool going mm-hmm. to see like who was going to uh, who could guess the right amount of employees that would get COVID wow. on the job. That's awful. And like, yeah, I, I mean, all of, <laughs> if nothing else, this whole the pandemic does lay bare at just how much your boss hates you mm-hmm. and um, how I think like every worker probably just needs a union to protect them on yeah. the job because there's no one else that's going to show up for you other than, you know, your fellow mm-hmm. workers. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, like it, it shows you so many things, but uh, I don't know how you could walk away from this thinking that like, well, I don't know how you could go. We could go away from this whole pandemic thinking that like um, <laughs> universal health care is bad or that like having a union is bad. Those two things seem like unimpeachable at this yeah. point from uh, the pandemic. <laughs> the big lessons. to yeah. learn. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess that's the whole conversation itself. Why don't people learn these li- these lessons uh, on their own? I mean, ideology, et cetera, whatever. 
Um, but also, I think it is, uh, it's like these kinds of efforts, having these big public campaigns. Um, it's also showing how important those kinds of things are. You know, I don't really know what, like, I don't know how you would measure the efficacy of something like this. Like, Development of Peace has a lot of members. Um, they send a lot of emails, but they also have, you know, groups that get together and meet and talk about being a Catholic in the world, all the rest of it. Um, that all seems pretty good to me. And uh, they're clearly trying to direct people toward these sorts of things. And you have to imagine all the other signatories on this uh, have, you know, their own constituencies, right? Whether it's like a group of nuns or <laughs> whoever else is, is on this list, there's all kinds of different groups that are being uh, tapped into by virtue of those kind of connections. And I guess to me, that's the big question is like, you know, the pandemic makes it so hard to get anything done, but how do you sort of mobilize and get people thinking about a just recovery? Because the thing is like, at the end of this, you know, like every liberal democracy is going to pour billions of dollars into their economy when this is all over to try to jumpstart it. And they're going to do that in the stupidest ways imaginable, right? Like we, we already know yeah. that they're going to pour all that into bailing out industries that start crying about how they didn't get any money. Like hotels are going to get billions of dollars. Airlines are going to get billions of dollars. And meanwhile, all those industries are going to be flooded by people desperate to like go on a vacation and so they're going to mm -hmm. make like bank when that happens for sure. I mean, you know, like this is they're going to make bank and they're also going to like lay off a bunch yeah. of their workers. At the same exactly. Time, right. Yeah. They're, they're going to make sure that they get the most out of this. Yeah. And not expand benefits or, or any of that kind of thing. So to me, it's like right. we all know that that's coming. I mean, we all who think about these things, I guess, know that that's coming. So it's like, um, <laughs> how do you prepare now for that inevitability rather than kind of waiting for it to happen and then get pissed when it shows up at your door, you know, and. I guess to me, it's like, I don't know, like the, the best you can probably do is be part of some kind of organization, whether it's a socialist one or a Christian one or something that is trying to mobilize people now in whatever meager ways are possible. And, uh, you know, like um, be aware of, of what these campaigns are doing. Like that's that's the least that these people can do. And I think it's actually kind of a lot to like be telling people, yeah, we need a uh, attention on building workers power, giving people the right to unionize and, you know, framing that in terms of like the rights of indigenous peoples, et cetera. Like that's uh, that's a very important thing to be doing right this moment is finding people who are already doing the work. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, man. I think like once a week or at least once every two weeks, someone will DM me or email me and be like, hey, Matt. I've heard you on this podcast. What organization do I right. need to join to, to be a part of this? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, but other people in your community do for sure. So ask somebody, ask somebody else, right. not me. What do I know? <laughs> um, but it, it's true. Other people are doing this work already. And it's so important to be plugged into it somewhere along the line, whether it is, you know, a socialist party uh, or whatever, or just a labor union or uh, some other kind of, kind of advocacy organization. It's so important to be like involved somehow. Mm -hmm. Sign up for everyone's emails. Every every labor organization, every socialist party, get all of our emails, go into your inbox, see what they're up to in any given week because it's going to be so important to mobilize and actually like uh demand these things get done when uh you know when the pressure can actually be applied. Yeah. Uh in, in a meaningful way. Yeah, I think that's important too because you know, one thing that they say in like the Communist Party of Canada that I really appreciate is that the Communist Party is not for everybody. <laughs> like I think there's a misnomer that people think that communist parties are just out to like get as many people as they can possibly get in the door and you know admittedly sometimes it might feel that way that's fine but uh at the same time like it's a very big thing to ask people to take on board not only the history of communism but also the uh you know the organizational principles of democratic centralism or whatever else is is going on in a, a party um but the the presumption is not everybody's going to be able to abide by that and that's okay uh, you can go find some way to contribute to building a just society elsewhere. Right. And that's always my advice to people, too. Right. Is like, um, yeah, like if you can if you can hang in a socialist organization, you should like socialism is the way to go. We got to build a different economy. Capitalism is not going to do it. And I don't really know how else you're going to get there without some kind of organized socialist block. But uh, nevertheless, um, if you can't do that, like, I don't know, just go figure out what Christians are doing. it. <laughs> like, if that's where you feel comfortable and you can hang, like, do that and figure it out from there. You know, I think that 
uh, that's in the spirit of socialism as well as trying to sort of find out where you belong and plug in. And I think when it comes to the pandemic, like that's more important than ever, right? Figuring out how to plug into stuff now is going to be the important thing rather than uh, trying to sort of spin your wheels when you can go outside and everybody's kind of like, what do we do? Well, uh, you know, the Biden government or the Trudeau government are just sort of rewarding all kinds of business leaders for surviving, I guess. Right. Yeah, let me add one provision to what you said, Dean. You said go out and find what the Christians are doing. And that's only true in the case of development <laughs> peace or like, you know, people adjacent to them. Don't find out what Sean Fuchs that's is right, doing. Yeah. Don't find out what the other oh, shoot. What the, what's that guy's Dave name? Ramsey. The scary guy that was like laughing. No, Dave Ramsey for <laughs> sure. But Copeland. the other guy, oh, what's that guy's name? Oh, Kenneth Copeland. Don't find out what those people are doing. He, hide them under a bushel. Yes, do not. <laughs> Don't don't do that one. Don't join Kirk Cameron's big Christmas Carol. Don't oh, do that. <laughs> join, join the good ones. You got to join the good ones. <laughs> or, or, the, or a socialist party. I mean, one of the two, right? <laughs> yeah. The good Christian ones, uh, the socialist party, a labor union. That's fine. But stay away from the bad ones. That's what I'm trying to say here. Yeah, folks. fair enough. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Uh, you know, but I think that's the thing, though, is also like finding even those pockets of Christianity that are doing this that you don't know about already. Like. You know, I uh, also for people who don't know, I don't know why I'm informing everybody, everybody about uh, things about my life and our podcast that probably they already know. A lot of life news. Yeah, tonight. exactly. But, yeah. you know, so I, I do all this writing as a journalist for America Magazine, Jesuit publication. And I think I'm I, I feel really fortunate to have that opportunity, not just because America is cool and the Jesuits are nice to me and, and the other people at, at the magazine have always been kind. That's all true. Um, you know, they're great. I have a lot of good things to say about them, but also because the job itself and the constituency allows me to just get to know a lot of weird things <laughs> happening in Canada. And especially that has to do with like, it's my job as a journalist to go figure out what other Catholics are up to. And you discover all kinds of stuff, right? Like the, the Jesuits in Canada are always doing something interesting. The sisters of St. Joseph, Joseph always have some kind of uh, campaign or they're plugged into some justice movement that you probably didn't even know about. Um, they're like really into sorting out what's going on with bottled water in Ontario, <laughs> right? Like there's a, there's always some kind of pocket of Christians doing something that uh, if you take the time to figure out what's going on in your area or nearby, there's probably like some wild religious group that's out there uh, doing something. And that is definitely better than doing nothing. So I'll say that too. Don't join the bad ones, but do go out of your way to find the good ones. <laughs> Don't reinvent the wheel either. It's true. Absolutely. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, tons of cities, too. Uh, if you live in a city, that is. <laughs> they do have... Uh, there's such a thing as, like, faith labor alliances. That's a thing that does exist. There's a precedent for those. Find your local jobs with justice or your AFL-CIO. Well, probably... I don't know. I don't know what they've got going on. But it's a thing. Faith labor alliance. It's a It's a thing. Look, look for it. <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say. This has been a weird commercial for that. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, Dean, we've talked about we talked about these uh, the good Christians. We talked about what they're doing. Um, but what what about the socialists, though? What are they right. doing? What's what's the what's the uh, equivalent of the just recovery for socialists? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, there's lots of socialists saying lots of stuff, and uh, I don't pretend to have any exhaustive knowledge of it, but I did mention just now the Communist Party of Canada, so I'll, I'll mention what they're saying, which I think is pretty good. Um, they, they've kind of also mobilized a, a fall campaign around recovering from the pandemic. I think, again, just to keep harping on this, like, this is such an important thing to be forward thinking, right, to be anticipating that this is the fight we already need to be fighting and not waiting for. Anyway, glad the communists are doing it. Um, they have all kinds of uh, particular recommendations that are super Canada specific. Um, so you can read those if you want. <laughs> but I think the real key here <laughs> is uh, they frame this entire thing, the, the pandemic, in terms of workers are not the people who are responsible for, cr for creating this crisis. And workers shouldn't be the ones who are responsible for taking the brunt of it. Um, when we have to figure it out or, you know, when the punishments get doled out at the end, which they will. I mean, they already are, but they'll be doled out again. And I think that is the key. Uh, again, there's lots of um, particular things that that are recommended here, but it's that framing that's the most important uh, framing in terms of like, why are we allowing corporations to, you know, run away with profits in 2020, lots of uh, pharmaceuticals, lots of other kinds of uh, companies that are going to make bank off of this. Why are we still funding like 
tons of uh, military organizations and uh, ventures out into the world, right? Why are we uh, setting aside all kinds of public monies that could be used to actually help working people for, I don't know, bizarre projects like uh, <laughs> whatever whatever your local governor or premier thinks is, is going to be the next uh, secret to rebuilding their economy or something, right? Like, these are things that are all happening right now and uh, trying to always pull that focus back to, look, uh, workers didn't create the crisis and they shouldn't be the ones that have to uh, suffer in order to get us through it. I think that is the most important thing to just kind of keep saying over and over again. Yeah, um, we don't need to read all of the uh, all of the people's recovery points that the Communist Party of Canada has going on here because some of them are extremely Canada specific and it was just be kind of like wasting time. But um, a lot of what they suggest are kind of similar things to, I think, what a lot of left folks in the United States are saying, even like I, I think a lot of the talking points that are on this page are even things that you'd find with the with the DSA or something in the United States. <laughs> One thing that really sticks out to me, though, that I think I think is really funny. This is there's like no real reason to bring this up other than it's just amusing, I guess. But uh, there's a note in here under uh, a, a full employment policy that says uh, build free public transit, publicly owned. Sounds great. Uh, interurban rail bus services great 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 <laughs> but then it also includes a canadian car that's sustainable <laughs> i love that i love the idea of a canadian a canadian car owned by the that's workers right. for the people the socialist car i want the canada car yeah <laughs> i love yeah, it it's good uh it's great <laughs> it is great yeah totally well there's a lot of good stuff in this list um i think it's cool i mean there's the, this list is way more specific than the just recovery one which i mean they're both fine. I love them. I well, love one's them a party and one's not, you know? But yeah, totally. It's, uh, it's sort of a difference in con- uh, context. Um, but there's a lot of good stuff in them. I mean, even if you're a person that lives in the United States, it's it's worth reading, I think, what the People's Recovery looks like for the Communist Party of Canada because uh, I think it will... Uh, I don't know. It's a good thing to, to start th- seeing what people are thinking as politically possible elsewhere in the world and maybe even comparing it to what is politically possible where you live because... I look through this list and I'm bummed that I that like I don't know some of these things wouldn't even be on the table. People would just you know laugh you out of the room for saying a lot of it. Yeah, I'll say uh, um, they're not really on the table in Canada either. <laughs> you do get laughed out of the room for saying it, but uh, it is encouraging to see a a party make it part of their platform, right? And be like, these are our specific demands that we're going to organize around as this uh, pandemic. Um, ebbs and flows or whatever, and I think that that in itself is like an encouraging word to see. Hmm. Sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, it does sound cool. Uh, I'd love, I'd love to live in this, uh, this wild communist world with my good Canadian car, uh, going to Development and Peace Church for sure. <laughs> beep beep! Here comes the communist car. <laughs> um, maybe just to kind of close the conversation out, though, uh, I think it might be helpful to turn back to an idea we talked about, I guess, two weeks ago when Richard Gomelopolsky was on the show. Um. So if you didn't listen to that episode, you should go back and listen to it. It's a good one. It's one of the most popular Magnificast episodes <laughs> yet. So don't sleep on the Richard Gilman Opalski episode. Uh, but I, I guess I'm I'm thinking about the ways that some of what he was saying about love and revolt have a lot to do with the kind of moment that we're living through right now. Um, towards the end of the conversation we had with him, we were kind of talking about um, what is what does love have to do with uh, going out into the streets and like demanding things and uh, even maybe being kind of rowdy if, <laughs> if it comes to that. Right. And uh, he said that, you know, when you gather in the street with people, when you show up to a protest, when you show up in revolt, uh, what you're doing is like, you're telling everyone else that you are interested in thinking of another world that's possible. Um, and I think that is kind of what we need in this given moment. Right. Um, whether it's just recovery, whether it's um, the people's recovery from a socialist organization or from, you know, whatever else. I think it's really important to show up in these spaces, where, whatever they might look like, you know, whether it's Zoom or group chats or whatever. And like, let people know that you're interested in thinking about what the world could look like, um, because the one that we have right now sucks shit. It's so bad. <laughs> uh, absolutely the worst thing I can imagine. Um and uh, but, yeah, showing up uh, to show people that this is like not what could be and to maybe talk it out to figure out what what could be better with people is like really worth our time right now. Um, you know, these uh, without people actually thinking about them and talking about them and organizing around these ideas, these are just like very nice lists of mm-hmm, things that are mm-hmm. impossible. Um, but if people actually do invest in them, uh, you know, they become possible. <laughs> The way things work, I guess. Yeah. And I think, you know, we we always talk on the show. The point of the show, I guess, is to try to make those boundaries between Christianity and socialism a little more porous. 
And I think that comparing all these lists is, is actually really revealing, right? Like, uh, there's not a lot on the Just Recovery um, sort of campaign website that wouldn't be echoed in the Communist Party platform and vice versa, which isn't to say that they're synonymous or the same, but just to say that uh, if we are going to build a people's recovery and a just recovery, we'll have to uh, spend a lot of time thinking about how to reorganize the economy. And, you know, it's it's worth posing to Christians the question, OK, uh, we should be definitely having these things right. Redistributing wealth in a way that's equitable, making sure the workers have a right to unionize, et cetera. Um, the more you talk about that, uh, the harder it is to avoid the question of socialism. I think that is really significant. Uh, and on the other sort of side of the coin, uh, when you start talking to socialists about how we're going to need a lot of people in order to get a people's recovery, um, you suddenly have to start talking about, all right, well, how are you going to appeal to all these Christians and other kinds of people in the world? And if it turns out the Christians are already trying to meet you halfway with these other kinds of campaigns, then what can you do to sort of make your vision palatable to that and not alienating and, you know, doing the hard work of trying to be nice, and, uh, trying to be friends mm -hmm. with people that maybe you are not predisposed to be friends with. And, uh, when it comes to the pandemic, it is revealing so many things. Uh, the one thing that I think is most important for me is, um, it's, it's revealing the fact that, uh, we, we do have to profoundly do something different because this, this is not going to be the last time that people are messed up in a big, big way. And uh, there's yeah, totally. there's other countries that are doing things differently right now. And um, there's people thinking about it in our own countries. And we should get all those people in one room <laughs> and uh, have a big conversation about <laughs> it instead of many, many little rooms. One socially distanced room outside <laughs> where people are wearing masks. Um, that does, I mean, putting it that way, too, makes me think of the the very first time we talked about the pandemic on this podcast when we read uh, that Mike Davis right. book about uh, bird flu, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I mean, if you don't remember, it's a long time ago. But um, the sort of point was that uh, the bird flu pandemic, we were just like kind of lucky it didn't hit the United States just the right way because it could have completely like decimated our country as uh, the, the way that it did others. Um, but I guess the point is, though, that um, without a real change in the way we think about public health infrastructure and so many other pieces of the puzzle too, like workers' rights and um, I don't know, all of it, right, that this could just happen again. I think that's completely true. Um, the thing that I also find really heartening, Dean, is that like, okay, so the just recovery um, uh, principles and like, you know, the Communist Party of Canada coming from completely two different points right yeah. <laughs> but like you said they do kind of echo one another's they echo one another they they have similar points right the you, you could they're not the same um the communist party has a different way of talking about it because like you said they are a political party but just the same like people clearly want things to be better and like um selling people on on material goods that would make their life better and that would make their neighbors lives better is actually popular right <laughs> it's like uh it's a thing that people really want to do i don't i don't know i i mean like maybe like weird wonky people on twitter and like politicians they want to means test everything they want things to be like inaccessible only to like the 0.01 percent of people or whatever um but it doesn't seem like that's the desire for a majority of people and maybe i'm just talking on my butt because maybe i don't really know but it it seems like these types of lists about recovery and sort of like you know when you see um, people who aren't even socialists start thinking about what they would want the future to look like. It's not, you know, means tested everything. It seems like, you know, <laughs> it, it seems very serious about the, you know, universal accessibility mm -hmm. of these things, mm -hmm. too. So I don't know. All that to say that uh, things that help people are popular political programs, even when uh, politicians don't believe that. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, it's easy to forget that because uh, the Internet is a, a very bad place <laughs> that doesn't give you any right. kind of encouragement and you know life is hard too i i have these conversations all the time with my people in my life who are conservative that i have to talk to for one reason or another most of the time because i genuinely love them and you know it's it's a real challenge to try to communicate these things and and sort it out in a way that's productive but i do think that at the end of the day it's those kinds of simple questions of like okay but what does a healthy society look like or what what is the kind of world that you'd like to live in if you could you know and i the best conversations i've ever had are ones that are kind of like yeah i do want to live in a world where everybody feels safe secure healthy 
they have access to opportunity, all that kind of stuff. And if you can kind of build those those baselines, uh, you can have better conversations about, all right, now how do you even get there? You know, and those are harder conversations, mm-hmm. but uh, to build a just recovery, they're the ones that you got to have. It's true. The only way to have a good society is just socialism. That's it. That's the episode. <laughs> that's it. That's it. As always, uh, that's how we're going to go out. And this year, too, uh, just keep being a socialist. Um, it is the last one of 2020. The big old balls uh, dropping. Um, and I don't know what else to say about that, except I'm ready to get out of this one, get into the next one and start yelling at Joe Biden instead of yelling at Donald Trump. <laughs> we got to do it. You got to keep yelling. It's so important. Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. If you like what you heard, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Magnificast. You can find us on Twitter at the Magnificast. Oh, I should say on the Patreon. We also have a, a discord that we started up for Patreon subscribers, and we've been having lots of fun conversations in there about books and episodes and all kinds of other stuff. So um, we actually use that one. So you can go there and talk to us more as well. Uh, all right. You can find us on Twitter. You can email us at the at gmail.com. Our music is always is by Amoria Armstrong and the Illogical Spoon. We'll see you next year. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord. Jackson. Keep your hoods up, and keep your hoods up, and you stay up late in Jackson. You keep your hoods up, where you keep your hoods up, and you stay up late. Oh, don't mind a cold night, but we might mind if you leave too soon. So. Still